And it takes a few seconds for people to actually seem to see the participant numbers going up. It takes a moment for people to make their way into the room. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to JWA's Book Talks. I'm Judith Rosenbaum of the Jewish Women's Archive. As always, very happy to be with you tonight. Happy Women's History Month. Happy Almost Purim, lots of women to celebrate in the Purim story. Um, please say hello in the chat box. Make sure to chat to everyone. We love to know who is with us in the room and where you are joining us from. The chat box is also where you should add your questions and comments throughout the evening. I'll try to bring questions into the conversation later on. A few words about JWA for anyone who is new to us. We are a digital archive we focus on expanding and transforming the way we understand history and Jewish culture by documenting and sharing Jewish women's stories. We also pay special attention to how gender functions in the past and present. And we do this work because we believe that uncovering a richer and more diverse and nuanced story is how we are going to make the world a better place. So thank you for being our partners in that work. Um, the book talks are just one piece of the work that we do. I hope that you will all check out jwa.org to learn more about the full range of projects and resources that we offer. A logistical note, if you would like captioning, there should be a button at the bottom of your screen that says show captions or CC. And if you click that, that will turn them on for you. Okay, we are really lucky tonight to have two authors with us modeling the collaboration and mentorship that is at the center of their anthology, Feminist Reclaim Mentorship. Um, which they co-edited and which we'll be discussing tonight. Great book, I highly recommend it. Um, Nancy K. Miller is Distinguished Professor of English and Comparative Literature at the Graduate Center of City University of New York. Her many books, many of which I have had the joy of teaching, include My Brilliant Friends, Our Lives and Feminism, Breathless, An American Girl in Paris, What They Saved, Pieces of a Jewish Past, and But Enough About Me, Why We Read Other People's Lives. Tanir Oxman is Associate Professor of Academic Writing at Marymount Manhattan College. She is the author of How Come Boys Get to Keep Their Noses, Women and Jewish American Identity in Contemporary Graphic Memoirs. And she's co-editor of the comics of Julie Doucet and Gabrielle Bell, A Place Inside Yourself. She's also a member of JWA's Academic Advisory Council. Welcome, Nancy and Tanir. We're so happy to have you with us tonight. Thank you. Happy to be here. So I was excited about this book from even before it came out from um, when I saw it advertised somewhere or maybe on your Facebook page to near um, both because I admire both of your work and because it's a topic that's really near and dear to me both personally as somebody who has been sometimes insufficiently and sometimes powerfully mentored and also to JWA um, you know as a multi-generational feminist organization we think a lot about men mentorship we try to do it we try to model it well um, and over the years, we've had so many conversations about both the absence of mentors and the power of mentors. So I would love for the two of you to start with a little bit about your own relationship and how you how you came to write this book together. Yes. So, Nancy, do you want to start with a little bit about your friendship book? And then I will. We have a spiel. So, <laughs> OK, so actually, I'm I'm kind of glad that you mentioned my my last book, um, My Brilliant Friends, Our Lives in Feminism. So I published the book in, in 2019. And I mentioned the date really because a lot after this is going to have to do with the pandemic. So just this is before the pandemic. So I had published this book and it was about three friends, one of whom was maybe the most famous person had been my mentor. And as Tanir and I were talking about the book, I realized that in my effort to theorize women's friendship, I had absolutely really not paid attention to the fact that this person had been my mentor. And then in fact, the other two women were, we were in maybe what people call peer mentoring now. And it was like a sub thread throughout the book that really ha we had not thought through. So I, I was a little restless after publishing the book and a little bit at a loose end. And Tanir and I start just started talking and then talking led to let's do something. Yeah. 
I think, yeah. And at the same time as, so we were talking about Nancy's book, you know, I had read an early, an early version of it. We were talking about the lack of stories of friendship. Of course, I don't think there's as much of a lack of stories as of friendship as there is of mentorship. And then at the same time, I was, you know, my relationship with Nancy had changed. I was a tenure track professor and then I got tenure and we were spending time together. We go to art museums. We have our art dates. I live in Brooklyn. Nancy lives in Manhattan. And, you know, I have like a network of friends in in the area. And I would say, Nancy, this, Nancy, that. And early on, I used to say, oh, my dissertation advisor, Nancy, I'm going to do this. And then event eventually became, oh, my friend, Nancy, oh, my mentor, Nancy. So it sort of became this talking point with friends where I would find myself having to explain our relationship and think to myself, well, actually, she's a mentor, but she's a friend now. And then that led to a lot of conversations with people about not only differences between mentorship and friendship, but actually what I realized is a lot of people would express envy about, oh gosh, you had a mentor <laughs> that you really connected with and you have this great relationship with. And, and this is when Nancy and I also had these conversations and we started to realize people had really, really strong emotional reactions to the idea of mentorship. And oftentimes it would be, you know, like this tearful look or a sigh or, oh, I wish I had. Um, and so I think talking about that and talking about mentorship in relation to friendship, like Nancy and I really wanted to dig into it and see what stories we could actually gather together um, and we also wanted to work on something together. And the fact that it was the beginning of the pandemic was very helpful because it gave us sort of this point of working together and being together um, that otherwise we may not have had a steady, you know, date. Right. It's, it is such an interesting thing that mentorship, you know, people sometimes talk about it as this incredibly powerful force and you're supposed to try to find a mentor and, you know, it's sort of seen as this like magical thing that can make everything okay. And yet when you talk to people about mentorship, there's, it's often so fraught and either because they've had a bad experience or some of us, I think, feel like sad that we haven't had a great mentor. And so there's a sense of loss, like, oh, other people have had this thing and we haven't. And, um, and you, in, in your introduction, you talk about how the concept of mentorship actually comes from Odysseus and, and you write about how that, because of that, from the start, it's like, inscribed in sort of power and men. And, and yet, obviously, you believe that mentorship can be extracted from that starting place from that origin and transcend that. Um, how, how did you think about the, the feminist component of this, like what it means, not, you know, you talk about people having these strong reactions to mentorship. How do you think about what feminism brings to those questions of power and differentials within some mentorship relationships? Well, <clears throat> we, I mean, the first, I think we had, um, we were obliged to confront the legacy of this, this, the mentorship story. And especially because we are academics, we're also aware of how the story of Odysseus and mentor, his pal mentor, <laughs> um, how much that permeated our entire idea of our becoming scholars and becoming writers. And it was very much part of our, not DNA, but it was part of our, our, our experience as, as writers and feminists. So at the same time, at the heart of this, of uh, mentorship, no matter how hierarchical it is, um, is a notion of a transfer of knowledge. There's there's something that has to happen. And I think the word transfer is pretty interesting because it takes, it talks about the relationship, right? It's so the, something happens between these two people. And the question about what makes it feminist is, how can we acknowledge difference, especially difference of power, and a little bit the way Italian feminists talked about it in the 80s, that we would acknowledge that there is a difference and that we are going to negotiate it. Mm -hmm. In other words, we're not going to pretend that it's not there, that it's not there, but it, it is there. But we have 
uh, a sense of what has to be part of the ingredients of making the relationship work. So we came up with, by the time we, we didn't start out with the model or we started out with a negative model, I guess. Um, and then in the end, we, we were able to pull out some characteristics that we were willing to call feminist, but we didn't start saying, okay, this is the feminist matrix. This is the feminist model. And we're going to pursue that. Mm -hmm. So what we're, go ahead and turn your, sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. Oh, no, I was just going to add that we, you know, we're both academics, but we both also write for the public, as they say. So Nancy's written tons of memoir. I do some journalistic writing and, you know, we didn't want to write like a boring academic book to be frank about it. And we, we wanted to theorize about what feminist mentorship would be based on people's stories. So these are really um, just collected stories. And we did spend some time trying to figure out like who, who to bring in there, because of course we could have had perspectives of men who were mentored by women or, you know, and we do have like non-binary writers. And um, so that was even just thinking through like who should be included and who shouldn't be included was sort of a puzzle that we had to work through to think about what feminist mentorship means. And ultimately um, what we kind of came to the conclusion was that we would gather stories and sort of hope that the stories would start conversations about what the potential for feminist mentorship could look like. So uh, what we did come up with, if like, because people often ask what makes for good mentorship. So we did come up with a couple of touchstones, reciprocity, transparency, and slowness are sort of our three main ingredients, right? So reciprocity, meaning you mentor each other in a way, or there's something that each person gets from the other. Transparency is just being very honest about where you're at, what you're expecting from the other person. And then slowness is a helpful ingredient in terms of just letting the relationship grow, even though a lot of our writers in the book talk about moments of mentorship, which can also be a really special thing of like, running into someone at a conference and having this moment together or at a bookstore reading or something. Um, so ultimately, you know, we really wanted the, the um, stories to kind of speak for themselves in terms of what bad mentorship looks like and the potential for positive feminist mentorship. And what ended up, the other thing that ended up happening is a lot of the stories ended up being about communal communities of mentorship. So more than one-on-one -on -one mentorship moving beyond that model that Nancy was talking about, the Odysseus inspired model to peer mentorship or just communities of people mentoring each other. Yeah, it was interesting to see that um, so many of the pieces are really asking that, trying to sort of explicate like, what was it about this experience that worked or didn't work? And what is the thread? And I appreciated people's both openness around that and sort of trying to parse their way through, but then also thinking about how do we expand this, this model? And there were some beautiful gems that I was like writing down as I was reading of different, because I was thinking about this question, like, as I said, at JWA, we talk about mentorship a lot. We feel like we mentor the young people who are in our teen fellowship, and we also learn a lot from them. So there is that kind of reciprocity, but also, and also we've paired them to mentor each other. Um, but, you know, I don't know that we've necessarily parsed out sort of like, what are the essential components there? And so some of the phrases that I love that I wrote down were Susan Gubart talks about my ambition for their ambition, um, mm -hmm. in terms of her relationship with her mentors. And I really loved that idea. Um, uh, Donna Ain Davis talks about someone who guides you on a path or opens the way for you. And this idea of like walking alongside someone on a path, um, and Melissa Cas Aquino talked about a mutual act of witnessing. And those pieces just really struck me as like capturing some kind of element of mentorship in a in a beautiful and way that I hadn't thought about it necessarily in the past. Yeah. And I do think you also learn from all the bad relationships, just in the sense that we had actually joked early on that we could call the book Tormentored. <laughs> because so many, so many of even the positive stories sort of start out with like 
a bad, actually the first essay, Rosemary's Hands by Rachel Adams, it's one of my favorites. Now, one of the tricky things about writing about mentors, bad mentorship is that the person will read it. Um, it's like any memoir, so you have to be a little bit careful. But uh, Rachel's essay came out in the Chronicle of Higher Education, and it's such a it's such a powerful essay because she moves from two experiences of bad mentorship, and they're bad mentorship in their own like very particular ways, and then she finds this like wonderful um, re reciprocal mentorship at the end. Um, but yeah, I think like a lot of the time there's the positive stories, but it's almost harder to name um, what makes for good mentorship. It's sort of like, you know it when you <laughs> experience it. And sometimes it's actually easier to name like the, the bad situations. What do you think, Nancy? Well, um, I think that the, uh, we tried not to begin with a grid. We, we tried to begin with, with getting the stories. And yeah. although we, in one of our titles that um, has gone by the wayside, um, we were going to call it, well, we, we played around with Tormented, Tor Tormentor, which we love. We knew no, no one would let us publish that. <laughs> and, uh, and the subtitle we had was stories, good, bad, and everything in between. So we really wanted to emphasize the, the fact that there was, that we're, we're not, Although we ourselves are looking to theorize the experience, we don't expect the people to do that. <laughs> we want their story of what happened for them. And some of the stories are, um, they're all moving in one way or another. And some of them are very sad and some of them are very wonderful. Um, and so we ultimately were able to create categories uh, once we had gathered all the essays that we were interested in. And so, um, Tanir, you want to talk about the, the our three categories? Yeah, I mean, we start with two-way streets. So those are sort of the, the two-person old school model of one-to-one -one mentorship. And a lot of those are where the negative stories come out, but a lot of those are also the positive stories. And one thing, you know, to remember is that even in communal uh, forms of mentorship, it, they're always um, bound by one-to-one -one <laughs> relationships. So there's always the one-to-one -on, one -one relationship, even in, you know, broader circles. Um, our third section is, we called it the traffic in mentors. We were using traffic metaphors. Um, and those were horizontal scripts. So those were like group mentorship. And some of it was accidental mentorship or mentorship outside of institutions. So one of my favorite essays is by Laura Lamonic, who's a friend of mine. And everyone in the book is someone we either directly knew and invited or a friend of a friend. And that too is our form of like showing these circles of connections between us. Um, but Laura Lamonic's essay is about um, having trouble in graduate school because her mentor she had had a, a baby and her dissertation advisor she didn't feel comfortable bringing the issues she was having balancing work and life with her dissertation advisor so she ends up finding this running group in Brooklyn and the women in the running group are all mothers and they're all sort of exchanging information and she realizes at the end oh this is the mentorship I was looking for and it's little exchanges and bigger exchanges you know when someone is sick um, the group sort of gathers around her and, and helps her out. Um, so that's the third section. And then the middle section is called Rear View Mirror, Mentoring at a Distance. And those were just the three stories that were sort of about, one is about um, a person who had died, who had been a potential mentor, and just thinking about how they had become more of a mentor after their death. Um, and that's by Ashna Ali, who was one of Nancy's students. And then Siri Hustvedit's essay, Mentor Ghost, is this gorgeous um, essay about actually not ever being mentored and not really wanting to be a mentor, but it's a lot better than I could describe it in a couple of sentences. I was very interested in that section because it's something that I've thought a lot about with our work at the archive. Basically, like, do you have to actually know somebody for them to be your mentor? <laughs> Could it be a historical figure? Could somebody delve into the con the content at the Jewish Women's Archive and find a mentor from a different century? And 
And I believe actually that that is possible. I have that experience with with the women in our archive. Um, we try to kind of promote that concept a little bit for other people. But I think for a lot of people, that's like a bridge too far. They're sort of like, what do you mean? That's not mentorship. You need to be in relationship with someone. I think I have a uh, maybe a <laughs> maybe I have maybe it's from having been in the academy for too long. I've forgotten that people I, I have a more, you know, uh, lonely sense of that or something that you don't it doesn't have to be an actual living person. Um, but I was very interested in that piece. And, and in fact, one of the pieces in that section is a poem by Joy Layden about being mentored in some way around gender by the Shrina, by the feminine presence of God. And I thought that was such a interesting idea of thinking about like, where can you find mentors if they're not actually present in your life? One thing I would mention is an essay that we did not get, okay, from a writer called, from Jenny McPhee, who is, you you may know as a translator of Italian uh, women writers, or well, not only women writers. Uh, she had promised to tell us to get, write an essay about how these writers wh whom she did not know and who were in fact dead, were her mentors mm -hmm. sort of going in, in that in that spirit I'm very sad that we didn't get this essay but um it is a really interesting idea that it was it was never going to be about a con a physical or that it was never going to be an exchange mm -hmm. it was going to be some kind of inspiration right um but so so that really was we were frustrated that we didn't get that but you don't get everything um we wanted to um, have a couple of examples in our introduction from, not from academia, but from what Tanir refers to as cultural touchstones. And we, we worked with uh, three movies on, with the hope that that would give people uh, a sense of, well, okay, it's not just these, these professional women in the academy. And one of them was nine to five. One of them was working girl. And one of them was the most, I think the most recent by with um, directed by Mindy Kaling called Late Night. Mm -hmm. And all of those um, films show different aspects of the mentoring process in, in, in domains that we were not familiar with, say film and, um, and so on, or even um, nine to five office work. I will say that by accident, I saw nine to five the other night on TCM. Mm. And I was on, I really was, I was on the floor, really. It was so hilarious. And, but, but really also it gave us a lot of material because it was a group, it were these women working together, right. To change the culture of work. And, and in that sense, um, I think it was a really very, very brilliant and very political in that moment of feminism when, pe when we're thinking about how do we make connections with labor, uh, equity, and can women do things together? Mm -hmm. So that was one of our movies. Katina, you want to talk about um, Working Girl? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the the reasons we also wanted to start with it and this really goes back to this idea of like what is mentoring and can a book or a spirit be a mentor um i think you know what we were realizing is mentor means so many different things to so many people so it could mean a role model it could mean someone to bounce ideas off of it could mean like melissa casa aquino also talks about mentoring as mirroring mm -hmm. so just someone to sort of kind of tell you who you are and where you're at we have one person who writes, um, Kami Wyckoff, who writes about a uh, therapist becoming a therapist and then her therapist as a mentor, her mentor therapist. Um, but I think, you know, we were also realizing how much our views of mentorship are also, even as individuals can sort of come up with their own ideas of mentorship and, and their own, they have their own individual needs. We also have these like collective ideas of what mentors should be, even when they're really not so great. So Working Girl was a touchstone that both of us remembered. Like I remembered it from my very, from like my early tweens and 
Nancy's rolling her eyes, but <laughs> and Nancy, if for Nancy, it was like a prominent film. And, you know, it was a movie that stood out for both of us about women in the workplace. And there's a very negative interaction with her mentor in that case. But there's also this hunger for mentorship that was so familiar to both of us. And it was so familiar from the essays that we had read. And so I think we were really, and and the other thing I think that if you read our introduction, so when we were um, composing the book, Nancy would send me text messages every time she came across the word mentor anywhere, which was often because the more you look for it, the more, and I've like still to this day, every time I crack open a novel or an article, I'm like, oh my God, mentor is everywhere. Yeah. But some of those um, mentor, you know, some of the um, appearances were actually quite nefarious. Um, Nancy, you want to talk about some of the ones that you? Yes, yes. Well, my 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 all time my all time favorite was uh, Trump being quoted by saying, "I need my mentor," who was to say Roy Cohn, and oh, I yeah. thought <laughs> it would it would have to be a Roy Cohn. It'd have to be a Jew. This was really <laughs> it was like right. and. There were others kind of like that. And then there were many instances in the news where we saw men uh, sort of manipulating the concept of mentorship. For example, we were very, we were fascinated by the Kavanaugh hearing mm -hmm. where he presented himself as um, he, he, he was a mentor. He, he was a coach to his daughter's soccer team or whatever, and that that was supposed to give him um, authentic uh, credit for for his role and yet and during the event he was he showed himself to be a total bully um and completely hierarchical and evil practically i mean right. i don't say practically let's i'll just say evil um but so we were constantly and then i found an extraordinary story about um a man in india who whose daughter wanted to play cricket and that he decided to organize a, this girl's cricket system. And um, he was the mentor. But what, what was so interesting about this article is that it said he hired a coach, which was a great article because you could see that a coach and a mentor are not the same thing. Right. And so for us, that was no. So, and, uh, and I, you know, I read the New York Times as a maybe it's a it's certainly a generational problem um, that um, most of my, my students do not share. But I but I did. It was a tremendous source of examples, good, bad and and indifferent. Right. Well, it, it, right. It goes it shows the power of mentorship in our culture as this thing that is has has a big kind of symbolic presence. And I think the examples you give show like, first of all, you should pay attention when someone tells you who their mentor is. It tells you a lot <laughs> about about who they are. But I think it also gets to that question of like, because one of the insights that I think it took me a long time to get to about my own experiences with mentorship was recognizing that um, I couldn't expect a mentor to be a mentor in all ways, right? That that was too big of an expectation. And, and Laura Lamonic says this in her essay too, sort of recognizing like, your dissertation advisor might be able to advise you on your dissertation, but maybe they're not going to be like your life coach for everything that you need. And for me, it was very helpful to recognize, like, I don't have to want to be this person. I just have to learn something about them. It, do it doesn't, I don't have to want to emulate every aspect of their life, or I don't have to feel like they have, they're going to be my teacher in every realm. It's right. like, they're one thing that I can, that I can learn from this person. And that is kind of pulling back my expectations did help a little bit. I think one of those one of the um, writers, Angela Francis, who had been a graduate student of mine, who was African American, and her essay had to do with what she called multiple mentors, re acknowledging, recognizing that one person wasn't going to be enough, and so that we so she had two or three mentors in different roles, and so that it was a kind of a she constituted her her multiple mentorship situation and not to have it not because it is true that the relationship with one person it has to work if it doesn't it can be very pernicious as we know right yeah and I think too as you know as we're in a time where as like I'm constantly reminded as a college professor 
a lot of the jobs my students are going to go into haven't even been invented yet. <laughs> and the change has been so rapid. Um, there's a way in which we tend to think about mentorship or some people tend to think about mentorship in this professional way, but mentorship can happen in so many different ways. And even in the professional context, you can mentor someone and not necessarily be in the same industry or, you know, be role modeling for them the exact life that they want. But still, there are things that, that you can give them and that you can connect with. Um, and I think that was really important, too. And also just recognizing and understanding that mentorship is not just a professional thing that, you know, activists are mentored and mothers are mentored and therapists are like, there are so many forms of mentorship available. Um, but Judith, it is along the lines of what you're saying. Like, and I think that's a lesson a lot of us have to learn. Um, one of my favorite essays is by Melissa Duclos, who's a writer I went to college with. She's a, a close friend of mine from undergrad. And she writes about, her story is about being an MFA student. I can say where, because she says it at Columbia and finding all of the um, professors there were men and she didn't really connect with them or the ones that you know she interacted with and she was not connecting with them. And ultimately she married a writer and then going through a divorce years later, she realized that part of the connection with him had been this desire for mentorship. Mm -hmm. But of course, part of also the realization was that she had put too much on the relationship by making this person the person who was like mentor and husband and all of these things rolled into one. And her story has this wonderful ending where she ends up in a backyard with all of her uh, female writer friends and they've formed this collective and they're mentoring each oh, other. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but that's like a lot of the stories I feel like carry that that sort of trajectory where I think I think there's a lot of false notions of mentorship out there that we too were going in with these ideas about men, what mentorship should be and honestly it was it's still to this day hard when we present the book to say no 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 this isn't just a celebration of mentorship this is actually there's a lot of stories of failed mentorship or just bad mentorship and that's part of it because you can't talk about one without the other Right. And and you raise some of the tricky things, too. Like one of the issues that I was thinking about um, is the fact that mentorship is often a form of unpaid labor. Like if you're a professor, then it is part of your job to advise dissertations. Right. So that is part of what your package job is. But there are all kinds of mentorship that people need or that people expect in workplaces and in other places that are not built into the like work expectations necessarily. Or they are, but they're just not, you're not paid for it. So I was thinking about that sensitivity of like, on the one hand, I feel definitely a sense of responsibility for the people who I work with and a sense of wanting to mentor those people or other people also who I just know in different areas of life. And also recognizing that that does take time and energy and you don't want to promise something to someone you can't fulfill and um, and all those pieces. And it, and it raised the question, which I don't think is answered or even really answerable about how do we provide that mentorship that people need from women without falling into the kind of expectation of, of another form of unpaid labor that women are supposed to be providing. Kinnear, do you want to add to that? Well, I was just going to say we end with an essay by Angela Veronica Wong, um, who teaches with me at Marymount, Manhattan. And um, her essay is about like systemic failures and all of the things mentorship can't cover. But and we also in our introduction talk about Roxanne Gay brings this up um, about how, especially for people of color, they're often given this burden of mentoring other people of color with good reason, because oftentimes people want to feel comfortable with their mentors in certain ways. But this puts an undue burden on people who are already underrepresented. Um, and the same thing can happen for women. And there's also this sense in which we wanted to really explore like mentorship and likeness and the ways in which so often and look at Nancy and me, we're both like Jewish, <laughs> Jewish women, neurotic. 
can I say that? Um, so there's like an affinity between us, which maybe I wasn't so conscious about when I started taking all of her classes at the graduate center. But, you know, it becomes apparent that lots of people are attracted to mentors who somehow, you know, remind them of themselves or their similarities in their backgrounds. So the trick I and, think- And people are attracted to mentees who are like them also because they want to replicate exactly. themselves in someone else. Exactly. So, yes. and, and I think that's a really important thing to remember so that you are making yourself available as a mentor, let's say. So this is something I think about a lot to people who aren't just like you. I, I think that's a really tricky thing. That doesn't solve, that actually expands the, the unpaid labor question. Um, but on the other hand, if like people are more aware and conscious of the ways in which they tend to mentor only people who are like them and they open themselves up, then maybe that also relieves the burden on everyone's part. I mean, that's at least one way of thinking about it. We have a question about something that you made reference to, which is what is the difference between a mentor and a coach, or at least the way that you see it, I guess, because people might have different definitions of that. Right, well, I used to have a make a, a Venn drawing with three circles and I should have, I could have been holding it up. Mm -hmm. So there's um, a teacher, a friend and a coach and you make this circle and and the mentor is, is just in this little place where the circles overlap. So a coach is someone you hire and the coach is, yes, the coach is invested in you but the coach is invested in your becoming a certain, playing a certain role in a certain situation. All right, so that's, that's it's it's financial and it's professional it's skill very often skill based you know and the and the example of india i was giving before the coach was to teach the girls how to play cricket better um but they he wasn't their mentor the mentor was the person who had conceived the structure okay mm -hmm. um so i'm so, and i just lost it by my train of thought what was the the coach you know, Oh, the coach. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Then there's the teacher model, which is you know, the oldest version of the hierarchy, right? But it has something important, which is the transfer of knowledge. The tr some, there's something that gets transmitted. And that's something that often comes from a great teacher. And then there's the friend who can bring in, I'm in, I'm in my circle over here. Mm -hmm. Then there's the friend who can bring in the emotional glue. But it... There's something though, something though in this moment of the mentor, which is not the coach and not the teacher and not the friend, even though there might be elements of that in the central place. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what makes it much more interesting than what people imagine. In other words, the old model is so strong that people can only imagine that it's a hierarchical, older, younger, you know, in an institution, patriarchal, and so on and so forth. And really, we work so hard to shatter that. And um, one of the, this is not in the Venn diagram, but um, that happened between Ten uh, Tanir and me, is that the, the relationship can ch change over time. And in our case, because of technology, it did not take long for Tanir to become my mentor mm -hmm. because I couldn't do it. <laughs> And and I learned from her a completely different style of working because she would things that for her were natural or appeared to be natural and for me were, you know, a tremendous struggle. So even though I had had this role of being the professor and her advisor and, and so on, by the time we were trying to write together, it, it was already ch it was changing in the actual process of writing. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that's something that um we have enjoyed talking about the, the the writing itself. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that, sort of how your relationship developed and changed and how that was wrapped up in thinking about mentorship and in your own mentorship. Tanir? So I love talking about our process because it was so much fun because writers are so often on their own in solitude. And um, when we were working on the introduction, of course, we'd gotten the essays. And what we did, it was during the pandemic. So we set up a weekly same time every week, a weekly Zoom, and we had a Google Doc up and we would write together. And what ended up happening was I had no idea we wrote so differently because 
as Nancy's graduate student, I really thought I had everything she had to offer. I had like absorbed. Um, but when it came to the writing process, so we would be writing together and Nancy would say, oh, let's take this these couple of lines over here. Let's cut them and let's put them on page two, like from page seven. And for me, who's a very like careful, slow, linear writer, that was shocking and really like scary for me and it was so wonderful to watch someone else do that and realize oh my god you can just move a couple of sentences from here to there and it works and then I think from the other side Nancy saw my sort of methodical recursive like does this comma belong here do we really want this sentence structure that way and so in this funny way we really complimented each other and it became this difference in how we worked that I hadn't ever, I, I don't think I ever would have realized before. Um, I, I think now of Nancy as so much more creative than I am uh, in terms of just how the writing happens. But it, but it was a, a really ex a interesting experience because you, as a writer, you you have your patterns and you. I was totally unaware of the fact that I moved things around and that Tanir didn't like it very much and she didn't really trust me and but now <laughs> I do it <laughs> and and then she was truly annoying with the queen of comma we would have endless debates and I always would give in to Tanir because she was so fierce about yes we needed a comma here no we did not need a comma there but um but it was actually interesting to unpack how you write I mean I it, because you have another person's eyes on what you on what you're doing right and i had been completely unaware of my <laughs> moving pieces around or that someone would consider that you know messing up the structure right and, and it's also it's kind of amazing to again as a writer like i tell my students all the time read out loud read your words out loud which we did we read to each other a lot over the phone we would read the piece over and over um but you're creating like this new voice together, which mm -hmm. is pretty amazing. And bottom line, I think one of the reasons we really wanted to do this collection together was just to get time to spend together, to be able to do events together, to like just hang out more. Um, and so writing together was just this like really fun bonus. <laughs> It is a very interesting thing though, to open up something that is so solitary and to try to do it in collaboration and to do it when one person has been the kind of like editor of another person, but not necessarily the other, although maybe you had already edited Nancy, but Tanir, but, but to kind of open that up and then, right. And, and sort of learn about your own process, but also see another process in action and be kind of forced to be a little more flexible perhaps in some ways. Yeah. Yeah to try new things, to go outside my comfort zone. <laughs> were there um, were there things that came up that were sort of hard, you know, like hard to, where you had really different perspectives and you had to kind of work through disagreements about an essay or about an approach or about something that should be part of the, the kind of theorizing of it? Yeah, did we battle? <laughs> no, I don't, <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think we were, um always equally excited about the essay, about a given essay but i think that in addition to the question of um the l literal part of writing commas and paragraphs and everything else um we had to work out the categories of the book we felt the need to do that mm -hmm. and that led us to um real conversations about how you know what was a legitimate what constituted a particular kind of structure, what did not, could we account for everything or, and so it was a kind of, you you had to be more um, flexible and honest with yourself because I, you know, I of course assume my categories are good, right? <laughs> Just um, like, oh, not really. <laughs> Um, and so it, it, almost everything, not, you know, everything really was up for, not up for grabs exactly, but up for discussion. And I think that that's not something that most of us experience as writers. Mm. Yeah. I think the one place where we deferred was our working habits. 
because I tend to want to just keep going. <laughs> it's a it's not a great habit where I'm like, nope, we got to finish. We got to stay here till we finish this. <laughs> and a lot of times Nancy would humor me and we'd be on the phone for like three or four hours straight. I mean, really, towards the end, we would have these epic phone calls. And then I would say, OK, wait, we have to send out an email. Let's do it while we're on the phone because I'm a multitasker. And I think it's partly an effect of having young kids and knowing like there's a ticking clock in the background, but it's also personality. I think Nancy likes to sit with things and, you know, think about them and marinate in very healthy ways that I was also trying to get a little bit more behind. Slowing down. One of yeah. the questions, oh, sorry, okay. go ahead. No, 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 no. Well, one question that, um comes up in several places in the book that I thought was really interesting and could be sort of tricky is the relationship between mentoring and mothering. Cause I think that that metaphor comes up a lot. And I definitely have had people in my life who, who saw the people they mentored as their children in some ways. And then I've had other people who have felt like totally offended by that comparison. Um, and I think there's also the fact that like, there's both, motherhood as a metaphor. And then there's also like motherhood as an experience that can either make you deeply need mentorship or also prevent the ability to receive mentorship. So I'm curious about how you, how you tackled that question around mothering and mentorship and how you think about it for yourselves. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the risk of saying I'm anti-mothering, but um, it is definitely not a model that I I would like to promote. I, I think we really, I didn't put it in my Venn diagram. I want to take the family out of it. Oh, but there's one essay by Sarah Glazer that I think does a really beautiful job of showing how within the family structure, there are mentorship patterns. Mm -hmm. So in her case, um, she has a famous father, Nathan Glazer, and a famous stepfather, Peter Gay. And she talked about how um, each of them showed her something about writing and for her to become a writer, she really became a journalist. But there's her mother, what about Ruth Gay? So Ruth Gay also is a writer, but she sort of late in life, it doesn't have the status of, of Nathan Glazer or Peter Gay. And, she, and uh, Sarah, this writer realized that her mother, was holding her mother actually was teaching her things, but they were not coded as mm -hmm. the the famous father showing how to improve a sentence. And so I thought it was really fascinating to think about um, how you negotiate your place within a family structure some of which you call mentoring and some of which you don't call mentoring, but that in fact was operating in terms of her development. Yeah, it is an interesting thing. Like, is there a certain distance that's required for it, for mentorship to be mentorship as opposed to something that's sort of more overdetermined? Yes. Yeah. I think too, you know, there's a long history of like questioning or fearing, at least for me coming up and a lot of my peers, like fearing motherhood in relation to, you know, becoming a professional. And I love to tell the story. This didn't make it into the book, but when I was a grad student and I was pregnant with my first, with my older child, and I remember being afraid of telling Nancy because it was really about my my own fear that I was in the middle of writing my dissertation and I thought I had internalized that sense of like oh now I'm not going to be taken seriously as a thinker it's just going to be about you know this other thing um and I I still remember I was sitting in her office there she has this great poster of Colette on the wall behind that was behind me and she she quoted grace paley and she said everyone both real or invented deserves the open destiny of life and i just remember like i had walked in so worried and you know just like thinking oh my career is over so you know sort of one of those moments you like for so long worry about and i left the office thinking oh okay 
like literature will help me through this and Nancy's my connection to literature and it's going to be okay. <laughs> and it was, you know, um, I don't think that's the case for a lot of people. I've heard a lot of stories of like uh, graduate students hiding pregnancies from their mentor out of fear or getting really negative comments or just being like marginalized once they become pregnant. So, you know, there's that angle too. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you see from a lot of the the stories, yeah, that same sort of like the, all of those questions around mothering and also around like relationships with mothers and ambivalence and all of that comes out in the mentoring relationship. And there's some overlap there for sure. Yeah. And, and it gets at that power piece also. It's like both the, the closeness piece, but also the power piece. I mean, it's maybe yeah. some of the things that can be dysfunctional in mentorships are not unlike things that can be dysfunctional in family relationships <laughs> too. Right. Yes. Um, and you know, the sense of like feeling overly invested in the person that you are mentoring because they reflect on you. And that I think can happen in parenting too. And someone, I forget who it was, but I wrote down the phrase, the myth of the mentor as maker and how dangerous that could be. Um, yes. This idea that you both in terms of like the power but also it's like the unidirectional piece and the power and the sense that you are, you know, the, the other person loses any sense of agency. Yeah. And I think that goes back to what you were saying before that, like, if you're, it's the same with motherhood and mentoring. Like if you are looking for all things from one person, you're going to be disappointed eventually. Um, Siri, Siri Hustvedet has this beautiful line about mentoring as an elixir that like needs to be sipped very carefully so yeah it's that same thing of like it is an overwhelming amount of power and that's why things like reciprocity and transparency are so important in that relationship right but i think that's also what makes i think you mentioned it earlier judith about susan gubar's essay where she describes how she thought of herself as this caring nurturing generous kind mentor to many, many students. And as she was writing the essay, she decided to send a questionnaire to her former students to ask them how they felt about the role, how they were mentored by her. And half the students said they had cried after the, they would either cry in her office or cry after the office, after the office visit. And that she had absolutely, she thought everything was going really well. She was completely unaware of how the emotional effect of being in her presence as a super competent, you know, brilliant writer. So I thought that was a very brave and interesting thing to do to, you know, to have people say, yeah, you actually, that was terrible. <laughs> right. To unpack that. But it also was a really interesting. I, mean, I also thought it was a really brave piece. It was also very interesting, though, as a reminder that different people kind of need different styles of mentorship or can, or have a tolerance for different styles of mentorship. Right. Like, my dissertation advisor was not a good mentor to me. I know she was a great mentor to other people, but it just wasn't, you know, it, some some of it is energetic or just sort of what you need from someone or how much positive affirmation you need or how much harshness you have a tolerance for and, and those kinds of things. Right. right. So there has to be, I mean, so there has to be this possibility of fine tuning. In other words, that we, that even though it is a structure and it has a history, that once you're within the relationship, it it has to it has to sort of be calibrated and moved, yeah. Over, you know, including reversal, which you know, which 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 does happen. It, it's so it's a little bit uh, tricky to to say. Well, we have here's our recipe. Pick someone, right? <laughs> pick someone you admire, but not too much. Uh, you know, pick somebody that you have an affinity with, but not identification and so on and so forth. I mean, we, we can just keep doing that. Um, but it's, it's, it takes, here's the thing. It really takes two people to work on it mm -hmm. in the, in the original structure of the hierarchy with your dissertation advisor, who's not your mentor and, and you, it's not two way. It's one way. But we are really keen on understanding a, a flow. And Tanir has a line that cracked me up um, in one of the paragraphs in the introduction. And when she's we're talking, or maybe it's in the end, talking about what has to happen or what can happen in a relationship. And then this line says, and then there's the time 
that comes when you have to mentor the mentor. And I was like, ah, definitely. <laughs> so I guess it's like a play between the hierarchy we understand but that's often within an institution that has other hierarchies and what the potential play there is in in exchange and have to you have to be open to it otherwise it is one of those nightmare stories right and i think also part of what you're speaking to is just that these are relationships that continue to grow and change they're not static right you don't stay the same way that you don't stay in the same hierarchical relationship once, you know, at Tanir, as you said, like you were Nancy's student, but now you're also a colleague and those kinds of things change. And that helps deal with the, some of the like external structural pieces of it. But also it's that these things change over time and relationships change and grow. And, you know, working with each other has obviously like brought you to writing this book together has brought you to a different stage in your relationship. Someone in the comments is talking about the change of children parenting their parents as parents age and then how that changes what one learns from each other or teachers learning from their students and and those kinds of things which um which happen as relationships grow and it's one of the things that's really i think some of the parts that were very beautiful in the book were about those surprises that happen right that a relationship yes. doesn't stay static it grows and changes and and can be can go to a surprising place which i think is really the the hope that those relationships can continue yeah. And I think the openness, like being open to it is the big part, right? Because if you're so static and your sense of like what the other person is to you or what you are to them, that's when you get kind of stuck. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that all the, most of the women in my generation who were also feminists did not, I mean, did not have this kind of situation. And we were, I mean, except I think there was one person, I think it's Elaine Showalter who said she had had a woman uh, advisor, dissertation advisor. But most of us had, uh, well, not all evil, but I certainly had an evil advisor. And, and that's, you know, and so I'm, you know, very aware of the kind of damage that that relationship can give. So in a, in a funny way, the old model is there like sort of a haunting, like, don't go, <laughs> don't go there. That is not a good place. Right. Um, so it, I think that that um, a certain amount of self-consciousness really is important from that point right. of view. Right. And those, and also recognizing the power that those experiences or those models have. So not just like I thought about that in terms of working girl, like that model of mentorship and it's sort of like a very negative model of women's relationships with each other. It has huge cultural power, but also our own experience. I think about this all the time that like. I worry that the bad experiences I had with mentorship that I'm going to somehow accidentally replicate them just because they shaped, you know, they shaped me in some way, even if I hope that I am going to react against them and create something different, you still get shaped by those experiences by not no, having had something else. So, but I think that gets back to your piece about just sort of like the transparency, sort of the self-consciousness and, and transparency about recognizing all the, all the factors that go into what the mentorship relationship is. Yeah. And, and just recognizing the range of experiences, which is just naturally happened when we collected the essays and we were like, oh my God, <laughs> look what's out, look at all these sort And even just sitting down with people and asking them like, or saying, hey, we're doing this collection on mentorship. And then the stories that would spill out so many that we could do like five more volumes really easily. Um, everyone has a story and the stories are all really different. Well, I'm very attracted to the reversal structure. And so the third movie that we talked about late night, I don't know how many of you saw it. Um, we have Emma Thompson playing the sort of brittle white boss in a TV situation. And they make a, a diversity hire of Mindy Kaling, who is, you know, just kind of an assistant. And as the film un, unfolds and various things happen, the last scene or the penultimate scene has the Emma Thompson character who's about to lose her job, come to the diversity hire and say, I actually need you. Mm -hmm. And so th I think that sort of changes, that couldn't have happened until recently. Right. Come but to it, her apartment in Brooklyn. <laughs> yes. Right. Like, you know, and she's like this Manhattan, whatever, executive. Fancy whatever. lady, yeah. yeah. Well, I think that's a good note to add on because I think it also, um, it, it speaks to that 
it speaks to a piece of, I think, the feminist impulse in this, which is recognizing mutuality and recognizing also the need for vulnerability. Like Emma Thompson in that situation has to admit that she yes. is not all powerful, that she has needs. Um, and I think that that's true in any relationship that obviously, even when there's a power of a differential, people are getting something out of it or else they wouldn't be part of it. And so being able to articulate that and being able to own that as part of the experience, I think is is definitely a grounds for it. And um, I think also part of what comes out both in your own model of this, but in the book too, is um, that part of what feminist mentorship is, is asking these questions and saying like, there isn't one model of this. It's something that we're exactly. going to create. It's co-creating it. And I hope that at JWA, we're inviting people into that conversation to be able to reimagine it and to reimagine it for ourselves and to be flexible and recognize what we need may change over time. Um, and I really appreciate both of you framing that for us and providing us with such great meaty pieces. I have to say, I read this a while ago when it first came out, or maybe I got it, I forget exactly if I got, I guess it, when, when it first came out. And then I was rereading it again this week. And I was like, I cried a few times reading some of the essays, which may speak to my own wounds around mentorship. But I think also just speaks to like how deep people's need is for yeah. these kinds of relationships and how much it kind of touches like who we are and who we want to become. So thank you so much for, um, for this conversation, for the work you're doing in modeling, for giving us this this book. And thanks to everybody who's with us tonight. And some of you shared very lovely stories of your own mentorship experiences um, in the chat. As always, I invite you to explore more at JWA. And we have a couple of um, uh, links to share with you. I wanted to share with you Tenier's article on comics and graphic narratives for our Encyclopedia of Jewish Women. And also Nancy is mentioned in our Encyclopedia article on literature scholars in the US. And when I was looking at our site, there are so many pieces that touch on mentorship that I could not list all of them, but um, I chose one by a woman rabbi named uh, Rabbi Leah Berkowitz, where she talks about what it was like for her as a young woman to become, to be invited to be a mentor to other uh, rabbis. And I encourage you to look at our site and our blog, and especially our pieces from the Rising Voices Fellowship for more on mentorship. Please, um, Join us next Thursday, same time, same place, for a conversation with Rachel Steer about her biography, Betty Friedan, Magnificent Disruptor. We're also going to be having a special virtual program on Tuesday, April 16th, called Let's Talk Gen Z Jewish Feminism, featuring four alums of our Teen Rising Voices Fellowship, which we're celebrating 10 years of the fellowship this year. I am sure that conversation is going to also include talk about mentorship. Um, I love working with these young leaders. As I said, I learned so much from them. I hope we are also helping to mentor them. Um, so I hope you'll join us for that program and we'll, the registration link is in the chat and we'll send it out as well. And until next time, wishing everybody a good week, a happy Purim and take care everybody. And thank you again to Nir and Nancy. Thank you thank so you. much. Good night, everybody. <laughs>